This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to the podcast of Mann Library's Chats and Stacks book talk series. In today's talk, originally given at Mann on Thursday, March 31st, 2011, Cornell Professor of Education Scott Peters discusses his book, Democracy in Higher Education, Traditions and Stories of Civic Engagement. Professor Peters presents oral history profiles of a dozen Cornell faculty members and their public engagement work, illuminating and defending an underappreciated tradition of civic professionalism in higher education. Hello. Um, this is going to be a little bit interesting and fun because some of the people who are profiled in this book are sitting in the audience. So, <laughs> hi, Marvin. <laughs> hi, Tom. And, uh, so it's a few other ones who were interviewed for the research we did. Um, before I start, I want to I want to acknowledge and thank Neil Schwartz back. Where is Neil? Um, Neil was my partner in doing this project and was a tremendously good, gifted interviewer and thinker. And and I had a tension. We had a tension between us between sort of the dark and cynical um, piece of our thinking about the world and the hopeful and positive and optimistic. And I think that tension played out quite, quite well, and I think is represented in the book. So thank you, Neil. I wanted to acknowledge your work. Um, what I want to do today, I, I created this book um, with Neil and, and others. And I also know that I saw Allison here somewhere. Allison Jack um, did one of the interviews for the book. Um, she actually interviewed Anu. Is in the book. <laughs> this got more than a little bit of awkwardness to it, this whole thing. <laughs> you should be speaking to me about things. And I, I wanted to say that um, I created this book uh, as a resource to provoke and, and stimulate conversation uh, as much as anything else. And so I'm, I'm really torn between me standing up here talking to you for very long. So uh, the approach I want to take today is to read some excerpts from some of what's in this book. To say a few things before I do that and a few things after I do that, but to hopefully restrain myself enough to leave time for you to, to jump in and, and start talking about what you see going on in these little stories that, that you're hearing from some of the people who are in this room. Um, so that's my good intention. We'll see what happens here with how I get going on this. I want to say first that this book emerged out of um, uh, international interest and conversation in, in higher education's public <coughs> mission and public purposes. This, this has gone through, um, in the United States, there have been periods of interest in this theme uh, starting in the mid-19th century when people were agitating about the need for higher education to be more connected to ordinary folks. And as most of you, I think, know that led to the passage of the Morrill Act in 1862 and the creation of the land-grant system. But there have been other periods through American history when people have become very interested in, in higher education's role in the world and its uh, contributions to the world. And they've been talking about uh, how we should understand that, how, how we should pursue that. We're in another one of those periods now. And it's a little difficult marking off the beginning and ends of these period, periods. But I would mark the beginning of the period we're in now uh, in the 1980s when there began to be some agitation and interest around people's sense that uh, maybe higher education wasn't doing such a great job with teaching, particularly for undergraduates, and maybe it wasn't doing such a great job contributing to um, the well-being of the country and, and, and people and communities. Service learning emerged out of that. There was a strong student-led volunteer um, movement of folks. They created something called COOL, the Camp Campus Outreach Opportunity League. Campus Compact, in many ways, emerged out of that, <clears throat> which is now still in, ex in existence and thriving. Uh, there's something, another national organization that Cornell's a member of is Imagining America, which is um, devoted to helping scholars in the humanities and arts to to become more engaged in contributing to the world. Number of books, number of many conferences, all across many fields. So we're in another one of these places where, where people are talking about this. This book emerged out of uh, my interest in that topic, my engagement in conversations in that topic. 
And it, it emerged, actually one of the points it, it emerged from uh, was a little epiphany moment I had when I heard uh, our former president, Hunter Rawlings, give the State of the University Address in 2001. And in that address, uh, he said that Cornell was a great private university with a public mission. And um, I underlined that in the copy I printed and downloaded from, from Cornell's website and sort of kept coming back to that. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that um, that sentence uh, didn't really speak for itself in terms of helping us understand, uh, okay, we have a public mission, but what is it? Um, and as I thought more about it, uh, the fact that that wasn't self-evident and the president did not go on to define what it was, um, I also realized that we talk about things like this uh, oftentimes in terms of our views and opinions about what something should be. Or our sort of cynical criticisms, I don't want to pigeon Neil as, as the only cynic in the room. We're, I'm cynical a lot as well, I'm sure, I'm sure most of you are. The, the cynics who want to criticize institutions for not living up to their public mission. So there's a whole line of conversation that comes from that. But the more I thought about it, the more interested I was in not, how, not hearing and understanding people's views and opinions about this, but trying to learn what it looks like when somebody's actually pursuing it. How is the public mission of Cornell or any other university, how is it actually pursued in practice? What are people doing when they're doing the public mission? That kind of question um, led me to uh, see that if we're going to figure out how to answer it, we're going to have to find folks who are actually doing it. And we're going to have to draw stories out of them. Have them tell us, what are you doing? Tell us a story of how you're engaged somehow. Um, there's a whole field of narrative inquiry and the process of doing interviews that are called narrative interviews. And, uh, this is where I situate a lot of my work, and this project, given that question that I came to, really um, fits that quite well. Um, so um, I got some funding from the Kettering Foundation after writing a grant, and I hired Neil, and we did a big survey and uh, ended up deciding to look just at the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences here at Cornell. We were about to celebrate our centennial. It, was, it seemed to be an opportune moment to be raising this question. Uh, we got, I don't know how many names we got first, 150 some names of people who were nominated by department chairs and others as exemplars of public engagement in this college, which is a remarkable thing <laughs> to, to show how many people turned up on somebody's list as, as these are folks who are really engaged out there in the world, and we were looking for that specifically. Uh, we whittled that down um, and ended up doing 44 interviews. And then we were faced with the thousands of pages of transcripts. And uh, with my mentor and friend John Forrester's guidance, um, we edited a number of these into profiles. And um, all of these, by the way, were being done by both students and Neil and I. So this was a very collaborative process of uh, producing all of this. So looking at this mountain of stuff and trying to figure out what to do with it and what we could learn from it, um, um, this is what came out of that. <laughs> and uh, I have um, quite an enormous sense of what's missing from this um, in terms of how much I learned from this project and from the profiles that are in this book, uh, how much more there is to learn from it. But as I mentioned earlier, I created this in part as a resource so folks, other folks could read them and ask themselves, what do we see happening here? What do we learn from these profiles? So uh, you can see, obviously, I can go on for a long time about all this stuff, and I, w I don't want to do that. So let me now um, transition here. Um, so the development of this book led me to believe that, that uh, all of these profiles, but a number of them, were important and powerful enough for what they showed us and what they could teach us that we needed to put them out in the world and publish them so that other people could read them. Um, so this book. Uh, began with the idea uh, that we'd find about a dozen of those 44 interviews that we could edit into profiles and, and put it as the heart of a book. Uh, 
I then did a lot of interpretation and framing and analysis and all of that on the front and the back end of the book. But the heart of this book are the stories that the, the folks tell who we interviewed. And when we did these interviews, we did them as approximately 90 minute interviews, a third of which was about, was the answer to the question of how did you end up um, um, as a senior extension associate here in Cornell in the department of, of what is it called now? Applied Management and Economics. <laughs> That's right, it's called the Dyson School. So the first third of the interview was the answer to the question of how did you end up here? And I can tell you for Tom, the, the longest answer to that question is Tom's, actually. <laughs> um, a great storyteller. He is a great storyteller. And very interesting um, description of his life journey and how he ended up in that position at Cornell. So almost a full third of these profiles are life stories. The middle third was a response to um, tell me a tell me a story about a piece of work you're doing that's important, and there was a lot of pre-work done to get that arranged before we did these interviews. And the last third was the response to the question of what do we learn from this story you just told us? What is it? What's the lesson here? What does it add up to? This is kind of the um, person's own interpretation of their own story as we were inviting in these profiles. So when you see these profiles, that was what went behind them. Um, that was the process that went into them. Um, so what I want to do now is read some, uh, a few excerpts from some of these profiles because everything I've said so far is abstract. And so now, what do these look like? What's in these profiles? Let me read a few of these so you can see that. Um, the first one is from Molly John. And uh, she was a professor in the Department of Plant Breeding. And she's no longer here at Cornell. She went to the University of Wisconsin. And in telling her life story, there's some wonderful moments we get in these stories. Her great-grandfather was a plant breeder. And she didn't discover this until she was in a great moment of crisis about her life and career. It's a wonderful story. Uh, but she was at MIT and had an NSF grant um, to do graduate work. Really, you know, student who was doing really well. I know there's somebody in her department who's here. Every, I, I got to say this, too. I'm, I don't, I'm going to prevent some of this. But there are backstories to every story in this, in this book. The, the, per, the people you meet in these profiles, you're only meeting one side of them from their perspective. There are many other sides. So we, 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 we're introduced to them in ways that show us a part of them, but not all of them. So there's complexity to every person in this, in this collection. Anyway. Molly was at MIT and got, had gotten very disillusioned and uh, was beginning to tell the story of um, how she ended up here at Cornell. So I worked at MIT for two years without losing my NSF funding. I had a really wonderful experience. I discovered that I liked running the lab, but that I was going to need to do something else. I did all these fun things like winter botany classes and this and that. And I thought, you know, there's more to what I want to do with my life than this. This is probably as good as it gets in this category of job. She had a technician job after she had decided to drop out of a PhD program at MIT, which was like a really big deal because that was the top program in the country at the time. Um, so I thought about plants and everything else, and I thought, what am I going to do? And I decided that I wanted to work on disease resistance because that would address issues of pesticides and human health as well as environmental safety. So I looked around for departments of plant breeding, and there's exactly one in the US. And this one here at Cornell is it. So I applied, and I think they had no idea what to do with my application. But I had my own funding, so I came. This was back in 1983. Plant breeders didn't really have labs as a standard thing then. I was stupefied at the challenge I faced, learning the genetics vocabulary, vocabulary plant breeders use. I really couldn't understand what people were saying here for several months. Fortunately, one of my fellow students translated for me for several weeks until I began to understand the language. The cultures were profoundly different. But despite the fact that I was a woman in science, which had been a huge issue at MIT, I was welcomed by these very traditional people absolutely without a backward glance. One guy in particular, Henry Munger, who had just turned 88 this spring, let me follow him around holding his note cards and writing down what he said for weeks that fall. He'd look at plants and say, clearly this is going on. And I'd look, and the plants looked all the same, or they looked all different. I couldn't see anything clearly at all. 
but I followed him around. And at one point he said, would you like to try to make some evaluations over there without me? Oh my goodness, it took me a full Saturday. But I was outside and I was working on crop plants and I felt I'd arrived. In this department, application was not a dirty word. In fact, clearly this was a department that had a long history of service and engagement, both in the US and in the developing world. There was a breadth of focus, but an integration also that I found very attractive. I found that it was not an elite, snobby environment. I know many people feel it's that way, but considering where I was coming from, MIT, Cornell was so down to earth. <laughs> I was in heaven. I really was. I really want to say a lot about this, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Here's a little story that shows you what I mean by down to earth. We breed food plants in this department. When I started as a faculty member here, we never bred pumpkins because pumpkins aren't food. Pumpkins are decoration. Well, it turns out if you look at the way farmers work locally, pumpkins could be the largest cash crop and they could grow in some, year, and they could grow in some years because for whatever reason, people pay insane prices for pumpkins, especially if, if what the farmer does is open up his field and let them cart pumpkins out of the field for $15 a piece. In the last 15 years, we've had a lot of people who have saved their farming operations because of this special holiday kind of thing with pumpkins. So we started looking at pumpkins. There's a disease that's very prevalent in pumpkins called powdery mildew. Well, my predecessor had spent 30 years bringing resistance to powdery mildew from this wild gourd in Florida. He had all sorts of things in the right species, wrong shape, like acorn squash, that had this resistance. And then we happened by accident to hear an extension person telling us about how they make aerial applications of this horrible fungicide to control this disease. We had no idea people were out applying carcinogens aerially to, to control it. And we thought, why don't we put powdery mildew resistance in pumpkins? So we did it. And the variety we bred is now in seed catalogs. Some say Cornell and some don't, because a lot of that germplasm went out before we had that identity. This issue came to our attention because we talk to people, especially farmers. When I talk to people and see where they can make the most money, then I'd better pay attention to that. As a plant breeder serving New York, that's probably relevant information. I live out in a little town called Lansing. I never aimed at an academic background, so my peer group is not the people who have the same job as me. The people that I run into, my neighbors, people I go to church with, and a guy that sells vegetables up at the top of the hill, they're people who tell me things like, God darn it, these pumpkins have rotten handles. If there's a major disease problem that accounts for 60% of production costs, and I have the solution sitting on my shelf, well, that's not a very hard one to figure out, is it? So that's a little glimpse into a story from a plant breeder. And there are many other stories from plant breeders that we got because we interviewed other plant breeders here. Let me go on now to Paula Horrigan, professor in landscape architecture. So when we interviewed her, one of my students, uh, Leah Mayer, interviewed her. She was telling a story. She, of course, told her life story and how she ended up here. But she was telling a story about a project she was engaging her students in doing on the north side of Binghamton. I live in the Binghamton area. My wife is a member of the New York State Legislature who represents the Binghamton, Binghamton area. It's a very economically stressed area. It's very gritty, to use a, a word that's I think pretty representative of what it's like, especially on the north side. So Paula organized this relationship with a, a community group called the, uh, I think it was called the Communities of Shalom, um, which is a faith-based organization that was trying to do participatory planning. And she engaged the students over the course of a, a semester in working with the community members to help develop a, a plan for the north side. Um, and she was doing this in, as an effort to help students not only learn the skills of planning, but also to learn the ethics and commitments of community-based participatory planning, which Paula is committed to, to teaching. So this is a passage from her talking about that. The way, of my, the way I think of myself has shifted a lot. I'm not professing. I'm mentoring students and community members. That's the other part of this that's messy. All of these relationships are built I met with the Shalom group a lot this past summer. Some of them are local leaders from churches, others are members of the community or members of the churches. Because of the nature of this whole project, because they are committed to their communities, they are much more a part of that place. It was interesting recently because we were at City Hall. Phil Stanton shows up. He's very active in this community. 
He doesn't have a car. He had a stroke. He doesn't have any front teeth. And he shows up to our meeting at City Hall. And it's like you can hear people thinking, he doesn't belong here. But Phil Stanton is willing to step into that scene because he wants to make sure that they're going to get what they need for the north side. He's extremely bright and extremely committed. And he's a very important part of the community. He presents himself as who he is. He cannot afford to get his teeth fixed. He's not that old. He's probably in his late 50s. He's been married twice. He, was apparently, he apparently was very athletic, and he was a Vietnam vet, and he had a stroke at a pretty young age. He has probably had a pretty hard life. The stroke left him with one arm and, that is numb, and he can't use it, and with a limp. He can move around, and he has somewhat slurred speech. He has to wear a sling all the time, and he walks strangely because he had, he had a stroke. So this guy shows up, and he's like a representation of the community just physically. He's a local person, and he represents all that the North Side is. People who have been around for a while and who don't have a lot of economic flexibility and don't have a lot of mobility either. They don't have cars. This is a big issue there. They don't even have a supermarket. The closest place that people can walk to is Kmart. A lot of people are getting their food, their nutrition at Kmart. They're not getting fresh vegetables and things like that. Then you get to know Phil Stanton, and he's an incredibly committed social person with this incredible consciousness. He's very involved with his Methodist church because they are very liberal and accept gays and lesbians. His friend's best friend is Sheila, who is a gay woman who is a very engaged, who's very much engaged with the community too. He's got an incredible open mind. He's very critical of city government. He's, he's going to peace marches in Washington now. He's got a very definite social agenda. He's very bright. He was very involved with our meetings to make sure that there, were local, there was local representation there. After one of the first meetings, when he realized that there wasn't anyone from the Muslim community there, and there are a lot of Muslims on the north side, he went out of his way to get a couple of people to come to the meetings. He called me and told me about a young woman who he thought we should invite. Basically, he made sure that she got there. He asked me to call her, too, and invite her. And then he made sure that she got picked up and driven home so that she could participate. He also wanted to make sure that there were young people there, representing high school kids in the community. So she's very much engaged. He's very much engaged. He just wrote me an email the other day. It said something like, the Burger King has closed, the bowling lane is gone, help. Everyone is leaving the community economically, so he's really very engaged with what's going on there. And he has no fear. That's what is amazing to me. He's not afraid of how he looks or who he is. He's ready to step up to the plate and do what it takes. He came to Albany last week and comes to all the meetings. He's very sensitive to who's involved and how to involve them. That's why I'm interested in doing these projects for people like Phil Stanton and Sheila. There is another character, Bob. I'm always surprised that he's still around. He must be about 70, and he's still trying to finish his high school education. He had a learning disability when he was young. No one understood it. He never got to finish high school. He has an incredible memory, but apparently he's had a hard time with reading and writing, but he's very committed to finishing this. Physically, he's kind of a wreck, too. He comes to all the meetings. It is hard to work with people like Bob but it's important that they are there and that the students experience them. It's one thing to find out that there's a neighborhood of people who don't have a grocery store and don't have cars. It's another thing to be in the same room with them. So that's Paula Horrigan. All right, I want to read one from Marvin's profile. I hope you don't mind, Marvin. Um, this is just a paragraph, but I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of richness in this paragraph. And, and it's something I've thought a lot about, and it, it has been a touchstone in my own learning and understanding about what is involved and required for people from universities like this to be engaged in the community. So here's Marvin is a, a specialist in, in berry crops and chair of the Department of Horticulture here at Cornell. And I have to just throw in that one of the stories Marvin uh, told in the profile was that he was forced to pick berries when he was growing up and really didn't like that. I think this <laughs> a kind of ironic that he's now a berry specialist. Small crops and berries specialist. So here's Marvin. You asked me about my relationship with growers. The growers have known me for years. They trust me. Probably the most important thing in developing that trust is listening. That's the key to everything really listen to what they're saying. Often growers don't have to hear a particular response from us. That's something that's hard for us. We think we need to do something and react. But I've got more growers thanking me for listening than anything I've ever done in terms of research. You might want to take that sentence back, but 
I like that sentence. But I've got more growers thanking me for listening than anything I've ever done in terms of research. For example, there was a fellow who had a hailstorm this spring and his berries got ripped to shreds. He called me practically in tears. I listened to him for a long time. He said, what can I do? What can I do? There's not much you can do once hail rips your plants, but we talked about a few things. He called me up again and again. I think the fourth time near the end of the year, he said, you know, things are looking better than they were. I have to tell you, you're a great listener. It was really wonderful you took the time and listened to me. It was the best thing you could have done for me because I was ready to cash in. I was ready to quit farming on the spot, he said. To know someone is at Cornell just willing to listen, that's really important to me. I felt good because I had been feeling inadequate. We want to solve problems, and what do you do when hail rips, rips you out? You can't spray for it, you can't change the cultural practices, and you're just a victim of circumstance. Listening was a good thing in this case. Um, I have marked a lot more to read than what I am going to be able to read, and I'm trying to restrain myself by skipping over ones that I really want to read. Um, <laughs> so let me um, figure out how I'm going to be able to do this. Um, I have to say, too, four of these profiles are from faculty members in, in horticulture, four of the 12. And I feel like reading something from all of those, because they're really rich. All of them are rich. Um, I'm, let me just move on here. Um, OK. All right, I have to read this one. <laughs> All right, this is, this, is, um, this is from Frank Rossi in Horticulture. And, and Neil did this interview. And uh, Frank is really a character. I mean, he's a great guy. But he's, he's a character, like in the best sense of the term character. He's not here today. He's, he told me he was out doing democracy somewhere in the, in the state. <laughs> So Frank's character really comes out in this profile. He's a feisty guy born in New York City um, and uh, uh, Italian-American, very Italian-American. And uh, he's got a really funny stories of how he ended up here at Cornell. Um, but it, even though Frank tells us in the opening paragraph that his job is disseminating information, um, everything in the profile is basically about him inserting himself between warring parties that are yelling at each other and throwing bombs and trying to ne negotiate and mediate uh, between these, these actors. And, and for Frank, who works in the, uh, on turf, uh, often a lot with the golf course industry, as he puts it, um, you know, the groups are the environmentalists who are concerned about pesticides use and, and legislators and policymakers and the agricultural companies and chemical companies and, and the golf course industry. So there are all these groups have different interests. And, and, and Frank is not just disseminating information to them. I can, <laughs> I can tell you that. And that's one of the joys of doing this project is that these stories just blew open our narrow understandings of what people like Frank, uh, you might think somebody who's working on grass is actually doing out there in the world. So here's a little snippet from his profile. If you want a good illustration of how I do my work, I'll talk about the project I'm working on at a golf course at Bethpage State Park with Jennifer Grant, who is a senior extension associate with Cornell Cooperative Extension Integrated Pest Management Program. We've basically taken all the putting greens on Bethpage Green course, and we're doing this large-scale project to see what happens when you stop spraying chemicals to control weeds and pests. We're in the end of the fourth year now. Laws are being passed to ban pesticides use. And there's very little understanding in the legislature and the industry or among advocacy, advocacy groups about what would be the real impacts on the ground of not being able to use pesticides. So Jennifer and I wrote a grant proposal to the United States Golf Association. And we said, we've got this big problem in New York, and we think you should provide some funding to help us with it. We, we proposed doing it on our research plots here at Cornell. And they said, you probably ought to do that on a golf course. And we're thinking, who the hell is going to give us a golf course and let us not spray when we know the grass is going to die? I approached my friends at Bethpage. I trained a lot of them through, this is on Long Island, Bethpage golf course. I trained a lot of them through short courses. And I said to the park superintendent, Dave Catalano, would you let me do this? Dave is such a visionary that he gave me this speech about how important it was for Bethpage to do this. I was literally choked up by it. And he felt that he felt so strongly that it was something that he needed to do. 
So anyway, the industry funds it, the state park system is in on it, and we've got these colleagues at the golf course that are working with us. So there are two sides. You've got the golf industry, broader scale, and you've got environmental advocates. Day to day, we're trying to get this thing going to set up our experiment on an 18-hole golf course five hours from Cornell in the heart of golf world. The project starts the year before the US Open is coming to Bethpage Black Course, so all eyes are on Bethpage. This is the first time a public course has hosted the Open. And then September 11 happens. And then it's all about New York. And every day I'm getting these phone calls about this project. What's going on? What are you going to do? Phone calls from the press, phone calls from members of the golf industry, phone calls from Canada, phone calls from Europe. How is this going to happen? And we're having these problems with, with pesticides and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Then the bombs start flying. We're about three months into the project. Golf course superintendents were calling me and taking me aside at meetings when I would talk to them about what we're doing. And they'd say, Frank, I hope those greens die so we can prove that we need pesticides. I really didn't have a response to that. I'd just say, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. And the environmental advocates were saying, you're probably going to let the greens die so you can keep using pesticides. And I said, well, I don't see what the benefit of that would be. I can appreciate why you think that, but that's not what we're doing. We took bullets from both sides. The industry was saying, you're giving chemicals a bad name. The environmental advocates were saying, you're not really doing the organic approach, and that's why the green di greens died, because you didn't go far enough. But we had very set criteria, which we had a really solid scientific pr approach to doing it. My dad once said to me, if they're shooting at you, it's because you're doing something right. Four years later, we're still taking bullets. When we began to release the results of the project that were really credible, legislators across the state started to look and say, we have to visit this golf course. They went and they saw that the six greens that we didn't spray died, drop dead. I have the pictures. They're very dead from very simple problems that pesticides would have solved. It wasn't unexpected. We tried to keep them alive by doing a number of other practices, including using products that had been shown to work experimentally. But what might have worked in research plots didn't work in the real world. You've got 55,000 golfers a year over that golf course. It is a totally different environment than a research plot, even when you might be simulating golf tra traffic. Six greens died the first year, and it created a lot of problems. W revenue went down for the golf course. And Dave, our park superintendent, who said we could use the golf course, said, uh, you know what? You, you can't do that a third year. We have to do some mitigation here. So we did some rescue treatments. Now we're in our fourth year, and we've come off non-chemical approaches. Now we're trying to do it based on, on an environmental impact model. In other words, if we use pesticides, we're using the softest ones available, the benign ones to the environment. And we've ranked them. Now, that's something that got us into another whole area of hot water. I'll stop it there. The story goes on with other dimensions. I mean, you see how much is going on in these stories? Do you, do you see the layers of complexity and, and you know, questions that I want to ask Frank and, and all of these folks. Let me read just a couple of more here. Um, I want to read one from, uh, from, from uh, Tom Maloney, who I introduced a moment ago. Um, and Tom also works a lot with golf courses, uh, does a, a great deal of education work with uh, managers in, in agriculture and horticulture businesses. Um, and this is at the, towards the very end of uh, Tom's profile. More and more people up and down this hallway sit around here and we ask ourselves, what's the direction of agriculture in New York? Like the folks in New York State Department of Ag and Markets, we're constantly looking at this entity as an industry and we're looking at where the industry is, as a whole is going. So when you start to think about it in that regard, you have to think about economic development in the state of New York rural economic development, and the well-being of communities. And it's not until the community loses half the dairy farms or half the apple farms that people start to say, are we losing something more than the $20 million in apple income? Are people moving away? Is the land vacant? Is productivity of the resources in the community less than it was before? I think there are societal and community benefits that are spillovers. People are asking why we need people like me, professionals who are funded by their tax dollars to address agricultural management and business issues. 
They think these issues can be addressed better or cheaper by private consultants. Well, some of them can be. But the standard response to that is that we're impartial. There are people out there who challenge our impartiality from time to time, but we're not selling a product per se, and a lot of the consultants, especially on farms and in landscaping businesses, are selling a product. And some of these consulting services come along with the product. So there was a bias there. We're not selling a product. We're not associated with a profit motive. I live in Cortland, and I live outside of town. There is a dairy farm across the road from me. I don't know if it's still there or not. There's a dairy farm across the road from me. There are field crops all around my property. My family and I like that community, and we want to see farmers survive in it. We want to see the landscape businesses do well. We don't have any fruit farms where I live, but I think New Yorkers would like to say they want to see the apple industry recover from a very difficult financial time and still be able to drive on Route 104 near Lake Ontario and drive through orchards. I personally don't want the landscapes of New York all to be blockbuster video stores and Applebee's restaurants and comfort inns. That open space is something that's really valuable. As our 7,000 dairy farms in the state diminish, we need to replace them with something that is equally acceptable to us. And so to the extent I can, I want to help people keep in business, doing what they're doing, what they're good at, doing what they like to do. Not all of them will make it, and maybe that's not such a bad thing. But to evolve to a state that is still producing food and has landscapes that are valuable and attractive to all of us is what keeps me going. One last one, and then I want to stop. And this is from my friend Anu in the front row. And uh, her profile is a two-part profile. I did the first part, and, and Allison uh, Jack did the second part. So um, Anu told the story uh, in the first part of the profile about her work in uh, developing the Cornell Agricultural, I'm sorry, the Cornell Organic Advisory Council. So I want to read this story. I hope it's OK, Anu. I feel literally kind of awkward with this, but <laughs> I think this story needs to be heard. In 1997, Cornell hosted a meeting of organic farmers in New York to come, up to come talk about organic agriculture. I attended it, and what struck me was that it was obvious that this had happened before, and it was completely meaningless to the farmers. They felt like, once again, they're coming to Cornell to say, pay attention to us, and Cornell would say, thanks for coming, and never respond. It bothered me because these people have a philosophy they choose to live by, and they're trying to make a living. There are fewer of them, and they don't have large amounts of acreage, but they deserved attention, I thought. What's the point of this? We can come up with all these lists of things that people have done at Cornell and they think are relevant to organic farms, but the fact is they're not. So the year after that meeting, I created the Cornell Organic Advisory Council. I invited key farmers and faculty members on campus across all departments who had some interest in organic agriculture to meet together and to design a research and extension agenda. This group provided a way to reflect on an idea and to focus its objectives. It generated mass amounts of support from growers, which has resulted in letters of support for project proposals. I wanted the Organic Advisory Council to have a mission. It wasn't going to be that once a year meeting where people got together and bitched about wasn't happen what wasn't happening. We had a first meeting in December of 97, and we've had it every December since then. The first year, we put together our objectives. The second year, we designed a research and extension list and tried to identify support grants. At the advisory council meetings, I was both the facilitator and the organizer. I did it all. I wanted a strategic way to spread information to people in the community as well as to share things about Cornell with those communities. At the initial stage, we invited people from several regions of the state based upon how the North Northeast Organic Farming Association of New York, NOFA, set up its regional districts. Our goal was to have a couple of representatives from each of those areas participate, and then go back and share with their regional groups. Brian Caldwell, an extension agent, and Steve Gilman, a farmer, were co-chairs. They helped facilitate the meetings. Steve could say things to farmers that I could never say, like, shut up, you're going off topic. Any of them could say things to each other or their peers that I couldn't, based upon trust and the negative view of Cornell as being disconnected from their community. Early meetings had a lot of back and forth. It was disheartening because there were some growers who were angrily saying, why do you want me here? You never pay attention to me. It took a while to diffuse that by talking, by being consistent, by coming back to them and saying, we still want to hear what you're thinking. Because you don't agree with us doesn't mean we don't need to hear it. We developed relationships with others in the community who actually could talk to particular people and help to diffuse the tension. 
will never get past Cornell the institution with some people. One of my objectives is that it should be about Cornell the individuals. I could go on for a, a great deal longer reading passages like those, which until we asked for these stories, we had no clue. <laughs> we couldn't imagine or see. Um, if this book has a value, it's because of the 12 profiles and the stories that people like Anu and Tom and, and Marvin and, and others told us. Um, I could go on about how I interpreted them in relationship to higher education's contributions to democracy. And you can read about that in the book if you want to. But I'm curious, you having heard some of these snippets, to know what it might have provoked for you. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.